Hey, what's up everybody? Nola Deej here, coming to you from the French Quarter. When you walk around the streets of your hometown, it's amazing the things you discover that you didn't know were there before. It seems every time I come down here, there's always something new that I discover that I want to go check out. I have a feeling the sign is lying to me. Right in the heart of the quarter is the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. It almost looks like something right out of Harry Potter. In 1816, Louisiana became the first state to require licensing for medical practitioners including pharmacists, physicians, dentists, and midwives. The building that houses the museum was built in 1823 for Louis DeFillo Jr., America's first licensed pharmacist. The building served as an apothecary and residence for DeFillo, his older brother, and their father, who were also local pharmacists. In 1855, the building was sold to Dr. Dupas and his wife. Dupas converted the second floor into a medical practice and rented or ran the pharmacy downstairs until he died in 1871. The building would change hands several times and was eventually abandoned around the turn of the 20th century as a result of hurricane damage. The museum opened in 1950 with donated collections from local apothecaries and Loyola University. The bottles seen here with colored water in the display window are called show globes. They were used as a symbol for pharmacy for several hundred years. People who passed the windows would see the globes and know they could purchase medicine inside. All right, let's go inside. Oh, wow. This is uh, much bigger than I expected it to be. Man, the scope of this place is incredible. There's so much stuff to look at. And I love the old architecture of the inside of this place. It's really beautiful. An old soda fountain. This particular soda fountain, which is still in working condition, was made around 1855. The soda fountain was invented in American pharmacies as early as the 1830s as another way to make bitter medicine more palatable. They would take powdered or liquid medicine and add it to sweet flavored syrup to disguise the strong herbal or chemical taste. Sparkling water was added because the bubbles were thought to have curative properties and stimulate the system. Most of the sodas we still drink were invented by pharmacists and sold as tonics. Patent medicines were regarded as the miracle elixirs and cure-alls of the 19th and early 20th centuries. They're arranged in the cabinets along the wall according to the ailments they were supposed to treat. Most were never patented but were called so because of the manufacturer's desire to keep the ingredients secret. Many tonics contain alcohol and narcotics that mask the symptoms while doing little to cure the patient. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 would require the listing of alcohol and narcotics on the labels to protect the consumers. Here are some ear, nose, and throat instruments from the 19th century. I don't know if I'd want that stuff shoved up my nose or down my throat. Some of the surgical instruments here, dating back to the Civil War, include amputation knives and saws, bullet extractors, and stone searchers. These were typically used without sterilization. Pharmacists would typically not perform surgical operations, but they did stock the equipment for sale to the medical professionals. This is a trephination drill and it's one of the oldest medical treatments known to man. Severe headaches were thought to be caused by too much pressure on the brain or spirits being trapped in the skull. So this drill was used to drill a hole in the skull to release the pressure. The mortar and pestle, which is a mixing bowl and wand, was used to pulverize and mix dried herbs to be made into pills, liquids, cachets, which were rice flour wafers used prior to gel caps, plasters, and injectable medications. The items shown here are a pill roller, powder paper folders, a cachet maker, invalid feeders, needles, and injectable medication kits. This period was really a turning point for the history of medicine. Some of the medical practices then would be very questionable today. At the time, patients would be subjected to the use of leeches in what is called bloodletting. This was thought to cleanse the body of poisoned or excess blood. 
Leeches would be purchased at the pharmacy and taken to the physician or barber for application. This also inspired the famous SNL skit starring Steve Martin as the medieval barber. Physicians would also prescribe known poisons such as arsenic, lead, and mercury to patients. 19th century pharmacists were not only responsible for compounding medicines, but also for manufacturing cosmetics, perfumes, paints, and varnishes. Most cosmetics were made with paraffin wax, which had the common problem of melting during the hot summers. This supposedly inspired the saying, mind your own beeswax. Opium was one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the 19th century. It was widely used as a painkiller, surgical anesthetic, sedative, and antidiarrheal. The understanding of drug addiction wasn't well known yet, so opium products like morphine and heroin were available over the counter until the passage of the 1914 Harrison Act that required a prescription for narcotics. Pharmacists during this time also sold voodoo powders and potions. The Creoles enjoyed a unification of French, Spanish, African, and Native American cultures that allowed for the practice of voodoo, especially the use of potions and grigri bags, to become commonly used in this area. Although the practice of voodoo was not acceptable in all social circles, those who wished to remain anonymous could purchase voodoo potions from the local pharmacy with no problem. Love and luck potions were sold under the counter using a numbering system. This inspired the song Love Potion Number 9. The items in this case are actual artifacts from Louis DeFillo Jr. They were dug up in 1986 in the courtyard behind this building. In the back of the museum, the prescriptions and compounding exhibit contains both tools used in compounding and prescription files. If the pharmacy was operating as it did in the 19th century, the view into the compounding area would have been blocked by another large wooden work surface and shelf area. Pharmacists worked in secret to enhance the mystery and alchemy of their profession and to add to the idea that medicine from such a grand and mysterious place would actually work. One of the very rare pieces in this collection is the 1860s hand-sewn linen prescription file with pockets for filing family prescription records. Some of the prescription numbers are even still visible. Suspended from the latter are hanging prescription files. Prescriptions would be skewered on a wire for storage here. The loggia, defined as an open-sided extension to a house, was typical of 19th century Spanish architecture. The indoor-outdoor space was designed to encourage air circulation throughout the staircase to cool the living quarters on the second and third floors. Creole culture dictated that visitors to the family would enter through the gateway and ascend the grand back staircase to the living quarters, while people conducting business in the pharmacy would enter through the front door. As it was very expensive to import herbs from Europe, it's likely that DeFillo grew plants in the courtyard for use in his apothecary. It's very interesting to be in such an odd place and then to walk out here to see this beautiful fountain. But it's actually very typical in the French Quarter in New Orleans. Alright, it's time to make my way up to the second floor. The first part we come to is the entresol, or a floor between floors. This served as a storage area, as the high water table in New Orleans is not conducted to building basements. This level would have been used to store both household and pharmaceutical supplies and served as a buffer between the business and residential levels. As I enter the second floor, it looks like they've got some 19th century dental equipment on display. Here's an old cash register from 1903. Wow. I wonder if it still works. Here's an old framed photo of a drugstore that used to be in New Orleans called the Live and Let Live Drugstore. On the second floor, they also have this big collection of eyeglasses and instruments from the United States, Europe, Japan, and even China, which chronicles the development of vision care from 1750 all the way up to the 1950s. They have spectacles of many designs, eye baths, surgical instruments, and charms that speak of both religious and superstitious beliefs associated with the eye. And now we're entering into this, uh, like a mock bedroom, mock hospital room. 
The room is arranged to represent what's called a sick room. 19th century physicians often traveled to treat the sick in their homes, as the unsanitary condition of hospitals discouraged patronage by patients who could afford home health care. Half and full tester beds were common as they supported mosquito netting in the summer and warm drapery in the winter. The vaporizer on the bedside table was used to treat affections of the lungs. Patients would inhale steam from a preparation of creosote, a mixture obtained from distilled wood tar and boiling water. I highly recommend coming here. It was only five bucks to get in. If you're ever in New Orleans, come check this out. This is really cool. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed a little lanyap from this hoot at and go pass a good time.